the time to show up today. We really appreciate it. Um, today's proposal is a product of a lot of discussion with members around the community. Um, something that we feel should be strongly considered and um, discussed with the entirety of the Boise community. Um, so, I mean, with that being said, I'll just hand it over to Karen Danley, uh, who I serve as the campaign management manager for. Uh, my name is Briggs Jackson, just for the record, but uh, yeah, uh, with that being said, I'll just hand it over to her so she can discuss the proposed city amendment. Thank you, Briggs, and thanks everyone for being here. I appreciate it very much. Um, and as Briggs has stated, I'm, I'm Karen Danley, and I'm running for Boise City Council C1. I've been observing, researching, and discussing my forthcoming proposal for the, over the last 20 years. Boise has been growing rapidly and has now reached a size where the current location, the election system does not work well anymore. In our current election system, Boise residents vote for all six council members at large. We currently have five out of six council members from two concentrated areas of town that are very close together. This concentration of decision-making power in one area does not accurately reflect, reflect the entire community. I'd like you to take a look at this map. So this is all the city of Boise. Of course, this is Garden City and some of Eagle, but this is Boise and this is where um, the concentration of power is. And this is one council member on the west side. Boise. Boise hasn't changed its city election method for over 50 years. The at-large election system is known to work well for cities that are small and homogenous. However, we are no longer that. We are now much larger and diverse, and our governing structure needs to adapt to that. I'm proposing something that will inherently change how we elect our city council. My goal, and I think it is one we share, is to be fair and equitable. You get the best outcomes when everyone is at the table. What do other cities our size do? When I looked at the list of cities and prioritized by size, Richmond, Virginia, and Garland, Texas were on both sides of us, so very similar populations. 13 wards, which is the same as districts, for Richmond, Virginia, and eight districts for Garland, Texas. We are at six at-large council members. Other um, places are similar in population. Madison, 20 wards. Um, Salt Lake City, seven wards. So we are the only one that is currently at-large and the smallest amount, six council members. My proposal is to elect six council members by districts. The benefits are accountability. With this proposal, each council member has a concrete constituency and each citizen has an identifiable representative on council. Two, secondly, fair distribution of representation. Districting would bring in leaders from across the entire city limits, from a diverse range of neighborhoods and provide a much broader representation. Three, candidates, campaigns and constituency, a districted system would encourage more people to run for office. The campaigns would be more able to effectively use their finite resources since the city's population would be divided by six. Constituents would become more engaged and more likely to vote because their vote will make more of a difference and the candidate would be closer to home. Four, repair disaffection from government. In our current system, the same group of voters tends to determine the entire city council membership. This creates the perception of winners and losers, which breeds, becomes a breeding ground for resentment. This proposal leads a way to restoring trust in our local government. Five, accommodate growth. Boise has been an at-large six-member council for over 50 years. Boise has grown considerably. Currently, state law prohibits more than six council members. This proposal sets out a work to work with state legislatures to allow for expanding the council. 
This is not aimed at removing any council member. The goal is to ensure that citizens have an equal representation throughout the city. We have made provisions in the plan to allow current city council members time to adjust to the new system. I believe Boise's best days are ahead of us, but in order for that to happen, we need to tap into the gifts of all our citizens and be the best that we can be. I have asked George Moses to consult with my campaign on this subject because of his almost 50 years of experience in politics and government. George's most recent position was redistricting commissioner for the state of Idaho in 2011. Almost 50 years and still standing. <laughs> uh, Karen asked me to go into some of the details of uh, the proposal and some of the ancillary issues that are going to come up. You've got a map in your handout. It's pink and it's weighted to show the voting participation in the city. Um, if that map were a patient and I were a doctor, I'd send it to the ER because that is not a healthy map. You've got large portions of the city that aren't voting. I know by reason of electrodynamics that we have and by anecdotal evidence, they're not voting because they think it doesn't matter. They think their vote's not going to make any difference, so they don't bother to show up. That attacks the legitimacy of government. If people don't feel they're invested in it, they don't have much respect for it. That needs to be addressed, and this does that largely by shrinking the pool of people who are involved with each office holder. By doing that, it's possible for a much larger proportion of that electorate to have a direct relationship with their representative. Right now, it's one to 250,000. There's a very small pool of people who have a close personal relationship with those people. When it's one in 40,000, it's a much different proposition. There are a much larger proportion knows the office holder or knows someone who knows the office holder. That gives them a direct state and you'll bring it in. Another way participation is going to, going to be affected by this is by a much smaller universe. You reduce the time and money and effort it takes to run. You're going to enlarge your pool of possible candidates. Are they all going to be good? Well, that, <laughs> but many of them will be and there will be some that never would have surfaced had it been as big as you got to run across the whole city and, and the whole media market. I'm going to move for a second to how these districts get drawn, which is a, a personal thing of mine. And also, the thorniest part of putting this together is how do you draw the line in the larger part? Who makes the rules? Finding someone with authority and standing to do it is harder than you might think because almost any elected official will be viewed as having a stake in the game. And if you don't like the map, you'll say he did it just to spite me. Uh, I, suggested a couple of ideas to Karen, but the one we came up with, I think is unique in the United States. We're going to ask that the heads of the city's recognized neighborhood associations gather, elect three of their number, that's plenty, to draw these maps. And they will draw six districts. Um, I'm comfortable that they will respect the lines of the neighborhood associations. I'm comfortable that if they don't respect precinct lines, Phil McGrain's gonna come after them. Um, but, what the thing about neighborhood associations that makes them so attractive is that they are unpartisan. Nobody runs for president of the neighborhood association as a Republican or a Democrat. It doesn't work like that. So these people come to it with a civic outlook. And they have this one job and then they go home and that's great. And we live with that. Um, state law gives the city council ultimate authority of this, but by, by enacting the proposal that Karen has put forward, that permission is granted. So uh, we kind of like the idea of involving neighborhood associations at this level of government. It actually gives them something other than window dressing to do. There are a couple of issues that are going to get raised that, that I consider ancillary, but I want to answer them now because they, they tend to get people's attention. There are those who say this will lead to the balkanization of Boise by dividing it into segments. If that's your concern, I'm sorry to inform you that about 35 horses have already left the barn. That's how many recognized neighborhood associations there are in Boise, each separate 
distinct with no overlap. If we were going to have that problem, we'd have had it by now. Um, frankly, I, you can say that about any electoral division. It's part of what goes on. You're representing disparate in, uh, interests. Of course there are going to be differences. But balkanization to the point where it's disabling, I don't see how. We have one city, one government, one city council, one mayor, one whole civic structure. Nobody in 15, uh, District 5 is going to raise an army and invade District 6. Not going to happen. Um, the other one is that people come up with the complaint that it will promote horse trading. And frankly, I have a little trouble with this. Um, of course there's going to be horse trading. That's what legislatures do. I have an idea, you have an idea, let's get together and make a deal. That's how it happens. Maybe people think that laws happen by immaculate conception. That hasn't been my experience. Um, lawmakers get together and they exchange their interests, and at the end of it they come up with something that nobody really likes but everybody can live with. That's horse trading. Um, whether people like this often depends on whose horse is getting traded and what they're getting for. Okay. Um, and you'll find that that varies. Tip O'Neill <laughs> used to say, I'm against any deal I'm not in on. <laughs> and I think some of the people who object to this are in that, <laughs> in that camp. Um, this is such thin gruel that it's been my experience that often when people raise it, it's a stalking horse for another objection that they have that they don't want to articulate because it's not nice. Usually it's because they like the way the system works for them and they don't want to change it. Um, a perfectly understandable human impulse, not particularly good government, and so it ought to be resisted. Um, that was what you asked me to cover, is that right? Did I leave sure. anything out? Mm -hmm. So Richard, well, thank you. Sure. Hi, I'm Richard Llewellyn, president of the Northwest Neighborhood Association. And Karen asked me to say a couple of words, just quite briefly, about why I support, as a Neighborhood Association president, this plan for drawing our, represent, our city council representatives from districts. And primarily, well, let's step back a second. The Neighborhood Associations are a great idea. Not all cities have them, and Boise does have them, and should be commended for doing so. They've been in existence for about 20 years, I believe. But there are 35 of them, as was just mentioned. And in order for all of these neighborhood associations to really be able to work effectively with the city, people need to have representation early in big city decision-making processes. Or not just big ones, small ones that affect your neighborhood more than other neighborhoods. So if we had a district representative from our neighborhoods, then we could be assured that at least there was some communication from our area to the larger city from the beginning. And that would make us be able to work more positively with the city, more effectively with the city, instead of sometimes becoming these confrontations after essentially the decisions have been made. So that's my real reason for supporting this. I think it will leverage and enhance the way that our neighborhoods can work with the city right now. So with those words, I will now turn it over to Bonnie Hardy, the remarkable president of the newly formed South Eisenman Neighborhood Association. Oh, here she is. <laughs> here she is. Oh. Thank you, all that came. Our neighborhood is new, and it's an example of what inadequate representation overlooked, not recognized as a residential area. We suffered through the RNL trucking terminal that there was no neighborhood meeting. We were considered non-existent. Then we found out we weren't even allowed to vote. So our area on the map is very faintly pink. During that broadcast of no vote, not one city council person called to find out what they could do. I called the mayor directly. He said it wasn't his fault. <laughs> and then my journey said, we got city services. Well, we didn't. Our fire that we had a year ago, 
was responded to in about 14 minutes, and then they argued who was going to put it out because one of the fire trucks didn't even have water. So representation, having someone in my corner, our corner of the world, there are two neighborhoods in the airport district have been overlooked totally. One of the presentations on the northwest uh, area when they were trying to zone an industrial, industrial area, uh, I mean residential area industrial, their conclusion was, oh, we didn't even know you were there. This type of representation would allow that representative to become acquainted with the neighborhoods to be a representative. We had to fight every inch for 10 months, nine meetings, disabled, a disparity group that had to really make efforts to make it the city council. We had no one to talk to. We had no one in our corner. I approached one of the city council afterwards and I said, would you like this in your neighborhood, these semi trucks? She goes, we don't have any roads big enough to accommodate a semi truck. And I thought, you're not even in touch with the reality of our neighborhood. Not one person had seen our neighborhood. They just, I just kept hearing, you're light industrial. So we were definitely overlooked, underrepresented, and I feel that this move that, that Karen is making would have made a difference a year ago for our community. And I full heartedly, heartily support this initiative going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. I am open for, I really appreciate Bonnie and Richard and George's support through this. Um, and I'm open for questions. Yes. I have a question. You're saying there's 35 neighborhood associations There's actually six. Six. Yep. Okay. Um, how would the, the communication between the neighborhood associations work? So great question. So uh, there would be three elected presidents. So the, all the presidents of each of the neighborhood associations would elect three people to represent them and to, to be the committee to redistrict, to redistrict, to district Boise. Okay, but in but redistrict still have all these communities that are have their individual problems would they be getting together as a group on occasion to discuss things you know the different neighborhoods together once the districts are in place mm -hmm. yeah that would be ideal right absolutely because well, yeah, like you're a, you're now a team right and you want to really communicate and you have an identity you can't communicate with them that way then where does this lead us down the Is there a possibility we can get change where we can have more uh, on the city council? More people voted for the city council? Oh, I think that's a really great question. And this is a proposal. Not just six. Not just six. And so the reason that I can't um, move forward with more than six, and you probably noticed that in the yes. numbers um, of other cities, is that Idaho has a state law that caps the number of um, city council on any any city so that would be another step to approach that oh yeah like in council which is 600 people they have six people on their committee on their city council and that's a population of 675 people in this whole city right so right how mm -hmm. did you know something mm -hmm. something is way behind the time right we're 40,000 basically 40,000 people mm -hmm. per council member and most cities our size are between 26 and 36,000. So we are definitely above from these. Oh, yeah. And I agree with you that that, that in, in the, there is a provision in the proposal, um, it's actually an amendment to city code that I would be proposing that uh, um, looks into and, propose, and uh, it advocates for increasing the size. Okay. Karen, One if more. I can just add, sure. we actually wrote this with an eight-person council who wanted to expand it mm -hmm. without going nuts. And that's when we stumbled over this provisional law that says we can't do it. So we got what we got. Okay, well, what about the 
listening. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll think about it. Okay, why don't you think about it? So, and we'll go back. Uh, it is important for us to look at the neighborhoods because in just the last few days, the oil tankers that are in Curtis are mm -hmm. in the proposal. It's going to happen to move them out to potentially your neighborhood. Exactly. And, um, you know, exactly. they, they want to move them out and make a little city dwelling. So, I mean, people in neighborhood associations really do need to have a voice in anything that happens within the city, and especially with the big ticket concerns, which are growth and the environment, the pollutants, and which there's so many, and fiscal responsibility. I mean, those are real important um, considerations. And if you are not living in, I don't know what the brown is, I don't know how the color code represents, I think I'm in green myself. So so this this the color beyond this is this is district 19 as far as oh, those are legislative but, districts oh, okay yeah but this is the best map okay. that was more to think. yeah so all of city of boise is outlined here in black okay okay so go ahead with yeah. your point so yeah the the idea that well i don't even feel like our district representatives are really necessarily uh, uh available to communicate with because that would be your first step i guess is to go to them if you aren't even being heard by the city council okay. Can you give me your example? i've contacted the director gentleman who is kind of running the trying to get people to get that move uh, those tankers yeah and i question them i said i'm not being negative about it i just want to know why you thought in a neighborhood that these tankers have been there for over 50 years oh yeah and now you're complaining about them. And you know what his response was? I like my house. Yeah. I like the neighborhood. That was it. Anyway, the, the whole point of neighborhood mm -hmm. being able to communicate is real important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why they, um, you know, most cities do have districts. And when we were much smaller, you know, as of a city, then we were more homogenous. And now we've just grown and there's more diversity and a lot more issues. Um, it's really important to me that somebody really knows the area, has lived there, knows the history, the people, because uh, you choose where you live depending on your priorities. And um, and that's going to make a difference in city council when they express that. I didn't think of that other question, uh -huh. which I don't know if this is off, but why is there only month monthly meetings of the city council for a city this size? You can't possibly accomplish all that needs to be done expediently. There's actually so weekly like, meetings. Oh, there are. Mm -hmm. no, because we were told only once a month. Yeah, that's what I was told. No, yeah, they're weekly meetings. Okay. Mm -hmm. That sounds more reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Yep. <laughs> Do you have a question, Haley? Yeah, so to me, it seems like the obvious argument against this is that in the current setup, every council member is accountable to everyone in the city. Mm -hmm. What would be your argument against that, I guess? Well, I don't think that that, um, I don't, I think my argument against that is these people in this area might think that, but there, there's a real sense of disenfranchisement outside of that area. Uh, it's um, feeling like they're not included, that they don't have a seat at the table. It's easy for these people or this area to say, you know, yes, I represent everybody. However, that's, a dramatic view of that would be like me saying, yes, I understand what it's like to be a refugee. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you do not understand what it's like in, because you chose to live here. I could have chose to live in the North End, but I had different priorities for the kind of land I wanted and the location. I had the same amount of money I could have bought there, but I chose to, to move actually at that time on the bench. So um, the, the reason there's districts too is because it, you want to engage everybody and have someone from your your local area that you know so then people are more likely to become involved and as the map on in the paper shows it really depends on the t voter turnout and this is why other cities do districts voter turnout is dependent on education on the time that they have the kind of a job that they have as a teacher I could barely keep up with politics because my heart and soul and my time was put into teaching. You know, um, so you have all different kinds of people that don't live 
in this area that's really the most affluent and expensive area. Yes. I, I didn't introduce myself by experience when I spoke. I, I worked for the Congress for six years. I've been in political campaigns from school board to president. I've been with winners and losers. Winning is better. Um, <laughs> to go to your question, it, it's been brought up to me by more than one person that when you live in Boise, there is nobody who is your council member. Mm -hmm. There is mm -hmm. your congressman. There is your legislator. But there is not a your uh, council member. And that breeds a certain disaffection. It creates a distance that's unhealthy. Now, when the city's 50,000 people, fine. Everybody knows everybody, and everybody thinks pretty much the same way. That's not us anymore. And so people, many people, and as you get away from that cluster, it's more and more, uh, feel disenfranchised. They don't, you know, those people talk to those people and they're not me. You solve that by bringing the representation close enough and to make them identify with individuals. So it's no longer an impersonal, the council, which is what you get when it's at large. It's the very personal, my representative. I think another thing to consider when that comment comes um, is what's, what's the source? Where do they currently live? Because if you live in this area, you're going to probably see, be more likely to be fine with the, the current system. And you're going to promote a system that keeps you in power. However, if you're outside of that area, um, you, you're you're not part of that system. You don't feel part of that system. You don't know those people. Um, Question over here. So, for instance, um, we're having a real problem with the water up on the bench, and the only reason that it's really getting any attention is because, thankfully, we have a state representative that's having problems with his water because he lives there. So now there's attention to it. So he's sort of like our leader in that, you know, in this situation. But other than that, we wouldn't, we would have just been, you know, flailing around ignorant and, you know, knowing that we have brown water and that our water tastes terrible and that we're all buying water and our toilets are erupting and all kinds of fun things. But uh, so thankfully, because of Gannon, we have attention. And he, that should be this, the councilman's yes. job, but he's sick of his own toilets erupting and all this stuff. So. <laughs> well, you don't have a councilman from there. Exactly. That's what I mean. Uh, we, uh, we, have, we would have no one if we didn't have Gannon. It isn't really his job, mm -hmm. I mean, per se. And I, I venture to guess that if that was happening to somebody in this area, that it would be brought to city council and say something needs to happen. Right. Yes. The representation is so important because when I reached out and I sent everybody a letter about us not having city voting rights, the only response I got was not one person from the city. I had to call the mayor myself after they received emails. Not one even email came back. So who did I hear from? Bill McGrain answered, Diana Luciano, is that not Jana? she called me, and Phil actually came out to our neighborhood and walked the streets with me, that he wasn't even involved in that type of thing, just to get a feel for the community. He came and gave a presentation, explained what happened, how it won't happen again, and reassured us but not one representative from the city. They said it wasn't their problem. And to me, we are left out because we aren't a affluent neighborhood. So rep being able to elect our own official for our district, our area, would be astronomical because mm -hmm. now we're gonna have a voice because Everyone is going to be registered, and we're going to be voting over at Micron this year. And so hopefully we're going to be a bright pink next year. Yeah. That's 
And I think that's the point, Haley, the answer to your question is these, these people outside of this area do not feel that representation is happening. In response to your question, I would just say that um, optics matter. And look at the map. And in addition to optics matter, I think actions speak louder than words. And that those of us that aren't living there, that are living in other places, do not feel like decisions are being made with our best interest in mind. We, we, we don't feel that way. And so something really needs to change. So I, I really applaud the initiative. It's a great step in the, in the, in the, in the right direction. Yes. You, uh, in redistricting, the, the data you use, almost everybody uses it because it's the best there is, in federal census data. Right. That's broken out by census tract. Right. That's small. Uh, the rule is, it's the statute, it's a Karen's proposal, that you balance population as closely as you, you possibly can. Um, and so you do it by moving these pieces around on the board respecting local boundaries, respecting local <coughs> features until you get a map and it's, it'll never be perfect, but it's balanced by population and it contains communities of interest as much as it's possible to do that. Uh, but the bu basic building block is the census tract. Right. What happens after that is that Phil Grain takes these census tracts and builds precincts. This has a waiting period for that to happen so that those precincts are in place before these districts are drawn. So that you don't cut through a precinct with the district line if you can avoid it. That's nasty for electoral administration. That's essentially it. You sit down with these with a map and the census tract numbers and you start, you know, you start with what would I like to do and then you work down to what can I do. Is that where would the neighborhood? It sounds to me that proposal is similar to what I understand the state does with the, the uh, commission. The it's not dissimilar. There are only a few models for this. And this is, and it's important, okay, but this is a small project. You don't want to get into something as baroque as what California has, which, God love them, it works, but it takes forever to put together. This is a one-time thing we're for six great. districts. <laughs> uh, so where, where does the neighborhood uh, commission, or you know, getting in three neighborhoods to How's that fitting into that? I understand what you're saying. I've got background in GIS, so I understand that. Okay, yeah. But where do the, as I understood, the three neighborhoods fit into that? All of the neighborhood association heads elect these three. That's the constituency. <clears throat> so every neighborhood association comes to the table. They select three delegates to go off and make the map. So it's similar to the state having the six people. Sort of the right. constituencies divide up differently, but yeah, it's the same dynamic. Okay. So how do they guarantee that those three people that they pick aren't in a cluster, geographically? If you want guarantees, rob the bank. <laughs> <laughs> um, you rely on the judgment, and, and this is what representative government is. You rely on the judgment of those thirty-five neighborhood association heads to come up with a group more than anything else whose integrity they have faith in. Because you're going to trust these people to do this. There, there's, there are no guarantees, except that you're going to get a map at the end of it. I think we can guarantee that. Um, but you're going to rely on their judgment. We pick people from a milieu where we hope their primary uh, drivers are in the neighborhood interest. They're not running for anything, at least not yet. Um, and at the end of this, they go home. That's it, they're done. So they don't have a continuing interest other than they want a good map. And they answer to their fellows in the neighborhood association world and to the associations. I mean, they don't want to go back and hear a bunch of people yell and they screwed it up. This would be a crucial time when you pick those three people that, uh, that people do their research and really get to know the area, the, the other presidents. 
and do pick them wisely and consider the geographical um, variety of people that you pick on that board. And you know, I, I'm trying to offer a seat at the table, so people are going to need to come to the table and, and meet us there. Are you communicating with the neighborhood associations? How are you um, getting this idea out to them? Well, today's the beginning, okay. and we will um, move it on from here and definitely take the show on the road, basically. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. And I'm with the Neighborhood Association. She's a Neighborhood Association. Sure. Richard's a Neighborhood Association. Oh, great. <coughs> and my neighborhood votes a lot, and they're, I don't think they're here, but anyway. Which, which neighborhood is yours? No, Sunset. Okay, great. Sunset great. Hollister yeah, sure. area. I would like to clean the pool. Yeah. We love your signs, your and, neighborhood signs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We just love your signs. Haley, what about the parts of the city, and it's not huge portions of the city, I'll be the first to admit, but there are parts of the city that don't have a neighborhood or a neighborhood association at all. Mm. Does that, how does that play into this? That's a really good question that I haven't, I wasn't aware of that, and I haven't taken that into consideration, so we would, this is part of starting the process. We would adjust to be sure that they're included because the whole point of this is to include everybody so that we have a better council, a better system, a better process. Um, when we set this up, we knew that the coverage wasn't 100% with the neighborhood association, but it was the best tool at hand. Mm -hmm. And nothing stops any neighborhood from forming a neighborhood association. This is highly likely to be a spur to some of these to form. That's fine. If that's one of the consequences of this, that's good. On the neighborhood association thing, again, having experienced it myself, when we were annexed in in 2014, no one knew about a neighborhood association. And I told the council, I said, we missed that welcome wagon. And when I called them to say, hey, I want to form a neighborhood association, there was kickback on that also, mm -hmm. saying you're not a neighborhood, you're industrial. And so the very zoning that the city changed progressed from agricultural to light industrial was all because of the airport district. Knowing that, I question whether the other neighborhoods even know such a thing exist because until they have a problem where they have to present to the city council and they have three minutes to do it they you don't look into it mm -hmm. and you know it's kind of like they're probably busy in their lives so my question is this the city with their annexation just i mean going rapid they need to bring awareness of the opportunity to form a neighborhood association because that is not being done. It's being overlooked. And I feel that the only way you find out about it is when you're before the city council and they say, time's up, mm -hmm. and you have nowhere to go, and then you have to fight to get an association. So the city has to take responsibility for that notifying neighborhoods, sending out representatives so that their entire city limits does have a neighborhood association. There's been some improvement on that front. The city's website now has fairly prominently displayed a neighborhood association toolkit. You know, everything you need to know about forming an association and where they but are and all that stuff. don't usually go there and look for that like if, if I'm going to do something with the city, that's probably the first place I'd go. Well, yeah, but it's usually, it's brought to your attention when there's some engagement with the city. Yeah. Whereas I think they need to be formed and healthy and a group before that nature of reaction. No argument yeah. there. That, that's kind of not what we're here about, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. It kind of tills in. <laughs> well, it's, it's a method of annexation, and part of that is following up with some kind of welcoming, and this is part of welcome to our city, and we would like you, here's some opportunities here, here's the tools to, to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you would have taken advantage of that. <laughs> Erica. Well, in, in by districting, then someone would feel some responsibility to go out to those untouched areas and reach out to them. Right now, sounds like there's no incentive for the ones who are there to go out to those untouched areas. 
So it would put an onus on someone to be that welcome wagon and say, do you want to be included? Do you want to be a neighborhood association? And then I'm just gonna say I support this because at the state level, we do this on the big end. At the fire district level, we do this on the other end of the bookend. Fire districts have three sub districts that they elect people to represent in the fire district. But we've got this hole in the middle with the city council that isn't doing this. So to me, it's logical. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Well, I have three people on my board. And, and the reason I ask is the state, correct me if I'm wrong, the state has six members, which forces some horse trading and tomorrow's pro things. And it also don't get the recipe for gridlock. I was on the council that didn't get a map because there were two counts count of members, and I will not name names, but if you followed it, you know what I'm talking about, simply weren't going to have a map that wasn't gerrymandered. And there were some of us who weren't going to have a map that was. And since there were six of us, there wasn't a lot we could do. Um, I've spoken with some of the people who drafted that. Their heavily misguided thought was that the, count, the commission would deadlock and the courts would draw the lines. The courts don't want to do it. They really don't want to do it. And when this one went to the state Supreme Court, they formed another commission. So three is necessary for swing function. You gotta have a time breaker in there somewhere. Yeah. You don't need a cast of thousands. If I could have done it with less than three, I would. <laughs> this is six lines, okay? Uh, in a very small, confined area. But the odd number is to force a decision. Uh, that's really basically it. It was, it was the smallest, most efficient package we could come up with. And, I, and the, so efficiency is part of it, and I think maybe what you're looking at is representation, so that it's more people at the table, is that right? That comes in when right. they elect them. Yeah, I, I'm thinking more on the, on the state level. Uh, oh, okay. And I realize there's been problems there. Yeah. Because um, I don't favor gerrymandering or anything. Well, the uh, problems are going to continue. Politicians. Um, but that's, that's fine. Because that's exactly it. If, when I'm elected, I will take this to city council and propose this to them. And what's going to make a difference, how receptive they are to it, is that neighborhoods from all around Boise, that that map changes. That, you know, that we don't have representation, that, that we have stronger um, voter turnout in these other areas. Because um, that will show that people are interested in, in what one of my top plat platforms is, is to have equal benefits and services and the way to assure that is to have equal representation on city council. Um, so that's part of it. And, um, and if that doesn't, if people aren't willing to um, take a really good look at that, which I think is really fair and equitable, um, then they may take um, a, an initiative <coughs> So when it's on the um, agenda, we will all come, and that <laughs> and that will be really important that people yes. come and talk about it and stuff. Yeah, we're gonna need to engage people yeah. who have not been engaged in yeah. city hall very often or ever before right. to help them get you know find their voice and feel that they can make a difference. I mean, hopefully, people will see that they will. Um, that this will be um, more beneficial for the entire city. It's a win-win situation. Because if you don't have those people at the table, you're going to come up with a, uh, a conclusion, and then it actually takes more time and money and energy for, uh, and on a whole for people to, um, to come, because you have all these people fighting it, um, whether it be whatever issue. Uh, 
F thirty five is the main library, but but so we're looking at the process and how are we processing um, the issue the issue at hand, and can we have a better process to come up with a better product at the end? Yes. So where would you say you are in the process right now, in terms of you know figuring out how this would work exactly, how it's done, etc. Well, today is uh, the culmination of research, and um, George drafted the ordinance in a manner that it's simply that I can take it to, to city council when that time comes. So it's set to go. He's had it vetted, um, and he has experience doing this. So that's why I called on his assistance. Um, so we're ready to do that. So, and, but also, I want to make sure everyone's included, that we, you know, walk our talk and you know the whole point is to have everyone included so um, and and this is the start of the process of, of talking about this and getting this idea out there but we're ready to go it could have happened yesterday um, if I was in City Council today it's a discussion draft it's informed to go it's got enough in it to go um, but you know the, the dough is there but it hasn't been baked yet that's kind of where we are with it. I have a quick question. I'm Tanya from Southwest Ada County Alliance. And I thought I had a grasp on this, but now I think I have a disconnect. I was under the assumption that, that we would take all the neighborhood associations, okay, and then we would divide them into six categories or six districts, okay, and then we would have council members for each district. But then you brought up the thing of having three people um, elected from all the neighborhood associations. So is it. I guess I'm just, I don't yeah, understand. There, there are layers here. You, you've blended a couple. Okay. The first layer is neighborhood. Now, it isn't neighborhood association is going to be combined to, to create the six districts. It's the entire city population. Okay. <clears throat> this job is assigned to the neighborhood association world. The heads of those associations elect three of their number. They draw the lines. They go home. Okay. They're done. What's left is six legislative districts, each of which will elect one councilman. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Great questions, any other questions? The hardest part of this is what, what you said about getting people to come. The people you're gonna be talking to know it's pointless. They know it won't make any difference. And so they know it's a waste of their time to show up. Your work is to get over that and get them to show up. The reason that I'm confident, and I'm, I'm not a big guy for municipal politics, to say the truth, but this is a kind of a fundamental change. It's of a scale that should command people's attention. It's bigger than a fire station. We had this discussion yesterday. Issues come and go. The process is permanent. It's gonna be there for generations. The last one was there for 50 years that we know about, maybe longer. Um, it isn't often that you get a bite of the apple this size. Okay. Well, I fully support this proposal. Um, I'm Dave Kangas. I'm from the Vista Neighborhood Association and Boise working together. But, and you will get big kickback from the North End power structure because they've been in power for decades. And the amount of spending that is done in downtown represents that and the voter turnout. Um, Boise is far more than the North End and north of the river. They have a whole different perspective of the issues than you do once you get out onto the bench and deal with traffic and growth. The North End doesn't feel it. It's built out pretty much. I mean, yeah, there's more building going on, but nothing like the rest of the city is experiencing. And it, has to change, and this is the first step. Um, voter turnout sucks for Great Boise, and that totally represents where the spending goes. Because if your vote, if you're a politician and you're getting elected by the North End, who are you going to serve? You're going to put most of your efforts down there to make to make it happen. So um, one question that I have that relates to that is people have had the housing and the development issue in all parts, not just in the North End, and that has really raised the hackles on many people in other areas besides that central area. 
So when I was out canvassing, one person that in the Highland area actually brought up the idea of this redistricting so that they're represented. And you know, when you think about who's been successful versus not successful in getting um, the zoning not change to adjust to the developer's desires. You think about how many people have crowded the rooms and how many times they've had to meet to actually satisfy the ire of the people. It, actually, there's a lot of people outside that central area that have many concerns that have recently been brought to the table with planning and zoning and the um, and the council. So maybe um, we're changing a little bit and getting out of that power structure. I actually worked at a school that was really attacked by that North End Neighborhood Association because of the way the design of the school was going and they wanted to they wanted it to be their way and they it, they were successful in delaying the school being built by eight months. I mean, they a, really a Boise school. A Boise school. Wow. So, um, yeah. So they had they have a voice, but now that so much is going on outside that area, I think a lot of people may respond positively to something else. Agreed. It's a chicken and the egg to some extent, and hopefully people become more involved, and we can make this change, and if we can keep you know to working towards something that is fair and equitable for everyone. And yes, it's it's difficult, it's challenging to for some people to relinquish power and see that fairness and that equi you know, the and to be equitable. Um, but I wouldn't clump everyone together. There are people who, who definitely are proponents of districting in in all areas. But it is likely and very common when you're in power to promote and, and job advocate for a structure that will keep you in power. A very wise old government bureaucrat, not our government, gave me a bit of knowledge that I carry with me. Power is never given. It is always taken. And that there aren't many absolutes in life, but that comes pretty close. If this weren't important, I never would have put a tie on this one. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. All right. Talking about the turnout, the three countries, the map here is showing 43% for where the three council people are close in on that map. Right here. Right here. Right there. Right here. Yeah, right here. Mm -hmm. That precinct has a 43% turnout. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've got three half the council is there. Mm -hmm. And That's so you have people <laughs> running yeah. for council from that area, which helps, but if we had small districts, you know, people with um, more moderate means could could actually run and and reach every person. Where if you're trying to reach two hundred forty thousand people, it takes a lot of money, and and I understand the nature of, of uh, elections and campaigns. Well, I do more now than ever, but um, but. I, if we had that smaller, it, then more people would hopefully run because they can see every vote is going to make more of a difference, and uh, it, they can do it with a more moderate campaign um, fund. A little bit of electoral mechanics. When you're sitting down to design a campaign, uh, the first question, where do I start? Where's my constituent? Who can I count on? These folks have built-in cadres of people who are used to participating. They start off a step ahead. And it's not unfair, it's just that's the way it is. If I'm designing somebody's campaign, I'm not designing Karen's, thank God. Uh, my first question is, where's your support? What's what, what gonna make your campaign run? These folks have it built in. These folks haven't done it in memory. If you're gonna change that pink map, that's how it's gotta happen. So it's more important now than ever to, to unite and for us to vote. Um, to, to make a difference here. Any other questions? David, do you have any questions? Maybe, uh, whatever you propose, I'm for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you get that on video? <laughs> 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 
you're, you're, buy, you're buying lunch. I'm not buying no, I'm sorry, I'm late. <laughs> there was, you know, just commenting is, you know, earlier this year, there was some comments on it on Facebook and stuff. I believe Boise Bench Dwellers, I mentioned it a couple times. I was just surprised at the kickback. That you know, people were protected. You know, not wanting it. Well, we represent all the boys and it came from the council. Oh, absolutely. You know, we, we well. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We represent all of Boise, but you know, it's just not the same. If you live in the North End, you have no idea what it's like to live out in Southwest Boise. Okay, it, it's night and day difference. It's not the same Boise. It just isn't. The impacts out there are far greater than what you'll feel down there. There's a built-in conflict with this, and it can't be helped because it's changed. It's important, and we've emphasized this every time we talk. This isn't pointed at anybody. This isn't designed to get anybody. It's designed to improve the governance of the city, and that's in everybody's interest. We will share, Karen will get some votes in here because there are people who are motivated by fairness, and they can see. This ain't right. That pink map you have ain't right. And it'll bother. You will we get a majority? Highly unlikely. But they're there and we're not out to get them. If we were, I wouldn't be in this. Right. It's nothing personal. It's about creating a system that's more fair. Yes, you do want to mention about the candidate council. Pardon? The city council. Oh yes, so there's a city council candidate forum on at South Junior High on Wednesday at 6.30. And all that? Yes, David. I apologize for coming in late. The only experience I have with districts other than the legislative district mm -hmm. in this area is ACHD. Right. So how have you, how has the district arrangement with a ACHD improved or failed to improve responsiveness to certain sectors of decision? I am so glad you asked that question. <laughs> I, um, one, number one, ACHD is an anomaly in the whole entire state. If it was a, a perfect system to have ACHD, other cities would have done it somewhere. It is an anomaly. It's also, so it doesn't, it, it's set up it's difficult to, for all leaders on the, at that table to to um, to be successful because you have a county system in charge of six cities' roads, and they have to divide that up between those six cities. Now it's also county, and that is even a look. If you think this is diverse, it's even more diverse as you get into the county. So I'm on two county boards. And I, I do ride horses, and you know it's even more diverse outside of Boise than it is within the Boise. So that's very difficult. You're gonna have very, even, um, and then the other. So this is not the county. This is a city, and this is not about transportation. This is about the city issues. Um, well, but it, it is about district organization versus at large and improving responsiveness. Mm -hmm. And so the only analogy I have is the ACHD structure. We're not talking transportation, we're talking the responsiveness of mm -hmm. candidates to geographic areas. Mm -hmm. So what you're telling me is maybe in the case of ACHD it doesn't work that well either to have districts. Can I take a whack at this? Sure, go for it. Uh, the system that ACHD uses is the same system the county uses. They are regional representatives elected at large. How many of you know the name of your county board member? How many of you know the name of your ACHD member? That's what's wrong with at-large representation. It's impersonal. This is direct. You vote for your representative. If you elect these, <laughs> this is my chance. <laughs> Let's say glad you asked the question. that somebody is running in District 5. There are four candidates running in District 5. Okay, Candidate A gets 42% of the votes. Candidate B gets 38% of the vote. Candidate C gets 20%, and candidate 4 gets the rest. 
But if you only count the votes in 17 and in, in District 5, candidate A gets 45% of the vote, candidate B gets 30% of the vote, candidate C gets 18%, and the, the other guy gets the rest. So you have elected to represent District 5 someone who was not voted for by a majority of the people in District 5. That is an abomination. Yeah. Any system that allows that to happen ought to be thrown yes. out. I, I look at it um, from being involved on the bench for so long that this is the first election in my memory where people are actually reaching out to the bench and the northwest areas. Mayor Beter hasn't been out in the last three elections. Elaine Clay hasn't been out. I mean, they just, I mean, they just don't, no reason to. There's no vote out there. So they concentrate on where the votes are at. My, I know my district representatives, you know, state representatives very well. I happen to know Jim Hansen pretty well too. I think it makes a big difference. But you do bring up a good point that when you're at large elections, it's, it's not the same. You're Thank asking you. the entire city to be your representative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're good with that, fine. Any other questions? It's time. It's time. The time We're is it. <laughs> We're happy to take this on the road, go to your um, neighborhood associations and explain it, take our map, and um, really invigorate um, voting in, in all 